changed by diversity loss and unsustainable resource consumption. These challenges include deepening global inequalities in many societies, trends of asset concentration uh, and wealth, which seem to have been, if anything, aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic in many contexts, um, and despite calls, of course, to build back better. Um, in addition, there are new specific and systemic challenges associated with digitalization and the activities of specific uh, tech corporations. It's to the point um, that corporations in general, their activities, influence, incentive structures and business models are deeply implicated in the problems the world faces today. This begs the question, uh, furthermore, through what international standards and mechanisms should corporate human rights impacts be prevented, uh, addressed and remedied? And over the last decades, um, for especially for participants who are perhaps not as immersed in the business human rights field as some of us have been, uh, it's worth uh, recalling that we have seen an explosion since the 1980s and onwards of new initiatives uh, to address corporate human rights uh, abuse from individual company codes of conduct to multilateral trade, investment and financial instruments, sustainability reporting rules, and now, of course, supply chain and due diligence legislation. In the United Nations, attempts uh, to define international human rights standards addressed to businesses have spanned several decades, starting with efforts towards a, a code of conduct for transnational corporations in the 1970s, followed uh, later in the 1990s by the project to conclude UN draft norms on business human rights. Of course, neither of those initiatives did uh, succeed in uh, concluding standards that were, were adopted. Uh, more successfully in that respect, you could say in the 1990s, we saw the emergence of the UN Global Compact as a CSR initiative referring to human rights and also um, of course, the UN Guiding Principles on Business Human Rights of 2011, um, a, a soft law framework developed or whose development was led by John Ruggie, uh, who also was the chief architect of the UN Global Compact, and John Ruggie, of course, who sadly passed away last week. Um, and arguably, you know, in spite or because of the status of the UN guiding principles as a soft law framework. Um, many have seen them as uh, having been highly successful. They're widely referred to and endorsed by other uh, international uh, actors and governance um, entities um, and certainly have given uh, an impetus to the wave of new supply chain legislation and other governance developments related to business and rights that we see today. Nonetheless, in 2014, uh, a parallel process was launched to develop a business and human rights treaty. Um, but uh, over the subsequent years, that process does seem to have struggled to make progress uh, towards the um, desired goal of actually adopting or concluding a text ready for negotiation and um, adoption. And significant actors have remained outside that. Have have remained outside that process, um, while other actors have uh, continued to register reservations to the overall approach and content. And in that context, since 2007, I've proposed a framework treaty on business and human rights, um, publishing in 2020 a first draft of such a framework treaty, and also this year an updated version where I uh, endeavour further to bridge the gap between the framework approach and the texts that have emerged from the uh, intergovernmental working group. Needless to say, uh, views uh, among scholars uh, and certainly amongst other actors differ and continue to differ on the relative strengths and weaknesses of a framework approach um, and indeed in relation to the um, merits and viability of the texts emerging from the IGWIG. Um, in that context, Today's panel um, will endeavour to uh, draw perspectives from across different um, subfields of international law in order to take a little step back, as it were, from the discussion in order to um, reflect on what we already know um, and what is the existing state of play in other domains of international law, trade, investment, 
um, from the perspective of regional and existing international general human rights law regimes, how does the business and human rights treaty endeavour appear from the perspective of those subdisciplinary uh, fields and the, indeed their substantive standards? What are some of the challenges um, and also opportunities that a business and human rights treaty uh, can present, whether it's a framework treaty or a treaty that resembles more closely what, um, what has been proposed in the third revised draft this year? Um, so, uh, and the remaining seminars in the series will address the topics including how such a treaty as a framework treaty could operate in practice, what are the general governance challenges that a framework or other business and human rights treaty um, should address uh, beyond those which are most familiar to us in the business and human rights space, how should a business and human rights treaty be linked to existing um, the existing business and human rights governance constellation and the other forms that business and human rights governance takes already in society. And finally, how the treaty process might be um, encouraged to um, move to a positive conclusion. And you will need to register uh, if you would like to attend uh, subsequent panels for each of those as you did in order to attend today's session. So um, with in terms of logistics, just a word and format uh, to say that we will hope to have time for audience questions following the panel's uh, initial contributions. Um, and I would encourage you all who are listening in um, from around the world, please to post your question in the chat or otherwise to use the raise your hand button um, so that we can call on uh, you to ask your question in person if you would prefer to do that. Um, the panelists today, we have asked to please provide lightning contributions um, of around uh, six minutes in duration um, in order to maintain a good momentum. And um, with that, I will I turn now to Peter McKinsky, um, a well known figure to many of you, I'm sure, who have studied um, in international investment law. Um, certainly in the field of business and human rights, uh, author of a leading textbook, um, Multinational Enterprises and the Law. Um, and Peter, I would just like to hand over to you now. OK, well, thanks very much. Uh, lightning presentations are not the usual uh, thing that academics are noted for, but I shall have a go. Um, two things I want to stress today. First of all, uh, where are we now with the third revised draft and what are the problems with its adoption? And then secondly, what are the pros and cons of Claire's proposed framework treaty? I must admit that I'm more in favour of the framework treaty than against it. So perhaps uh, others will correct my biases here uh, and provide more criticisms. Now, the third revised draft uh, of the LBI, the Legally Binding Instrument, isn't all that different from the second draft, as far as I can see. There are certain tweaks of language and so on. So the basic problem still remains that, uh, that there's an attempt in a single document to cover a, a wide range of questions about legal liability for businesses, issues of jurisdiction uh, uh, and other access to justice issues, and then procedural and institutional cooperation and harmonization. It's a huge, huge menu. Now, what is what, what are the supporters who are the opponents? Business representatives have consistently opposed the idea of binding international legal duties uh, for whatever reasons uh, they, they have. Uh, and they're increasingly looking to propose uh, safe harbour rules that avoid legal claims altogether if proper due diligence uh, in line with uh, whatever standards uh, the firm applies is carried out. Now, those standards could be the UNGPs themselves. They could be the contents of national laws. And the proposed uh, LBI, of course, has in uh, Article 6, I think, uh, a due diligence framework to be followed. Now, the major home states of multinational corporations, these are the states that ultimately would have to do the most heavy lifting to make a, 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 a by an international binding agreement effective um, uh, are a bit lukewarm on this. The US uh, and the UK stress progress 
through voluntary initiatives, uh, and in the case of the UK, national laws. Uh, the EU at the moment is in the throes of discussing its own mandatory due diligence project. Um, so far, the European Parliament has come out with the idea of binding legal liability rules, but whether the Commission will go that way is still a very much an open question. Uh, the French duty of vigilance law, perhaps the most advanced law because it offers a due diligence based duty of care, is uh, a potential model. It has uh, some uh, characteristics of a liability regime and there are cases be that, that are testing this at the moment. And recently the February 2021 Nanterre Court actually uh, established that Total has a positive duty uh, of care. Uh, down its network caused by the duty of vigilance law. Germany most recently has passed a law, but again, uh, while there's the, uh, uh, the possibility, uh, it says opinion in, in the written version of my speaking notes, it should be option. Uh, the, the German law has the option of a representative action, but it doesn't actually offer any new liability laws. Now, if one looks at the developing countries as well, there isn't a great consensus. This isn't a north-south issue as far as I can see. And that's one point of considerable difference between this debate and, say, the code of conduct debate. So, so again, there, there are problems uh, there. China and India, for example, are very powerfully saying that this treaty mustn't interfere with the right to development. So what of the framework treaty? Well, the pros that I can see of that is that it builds upon the existing UNGP's framework. It stresses multi-stakeholder consensus. Uh, it focuses on the main problem, which is uh, problems of how to coordinate national laws uh, and the multiplicity of different national responses uh, to the question of how to operationalize business and human rights. And in my view, the most important thing, which is shared with the uh, draft LBI, is setting up an institutional architecture through which these kinds of things can be debated. I think the main difference is that the LBI is trying to already establish a normative uh, benchmark rather than uh, leaving benchmarks open to future discussion. This is what the framework treaty can allow. It's not incompatible or opposed to these benchmarks being established. It's simply creating a different institutional architecture through which to do it. And one of the things about consensus building is that you need time. And the framework agreement gives us time, whereas the LBI insists on an ex ante agreement on everything. Uh, and uh, as the UN norms showed us, that's not going to work. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of tempted to support this uh, this idea. It doesn't rule anything out that the uh, LBI is doing, but it offers an institutional framework within which it can be better done. My final point will be that the proposed committee of experts in the LBI uh, seems to me in some ways, along with the mutual legal assistance provisions, the two most important things in the LBI. And the Committee of Experts can be introduced into a framework agreement because Claire, uh, in her draft, uh, it makes sure that in Article 7.3b, um, the conference of the parties that she proposes has the power to establish subsidiary bodies. And so Claire's institutional architecture could actually offer an opening for the most valuable part of the institutional architecture of the LBI to, to be brought in. I hope that's lightning enough because I'm going to stop there. No, that's wonderful. And um, thank you for your discipline. Hopefully uh, we'll we'll have an even discipline across the panel in terms of timekeeping that was. But that was a very good example you set. I wonder just if I, and during each other's presentations on the panel, if you do really have points that you'd like to come back on immediately or reflections or questions for your co-panelists, please do put hands up in the chat um, or on screen um, during the presentations and I'll, I'll be able to come to you immediately after. Is there anyone who had any immediate um, reflections in relation uh, to what Peter has contributed? 
not not immediately. Time time further time is needed for thoughts to um, percolate. Uh, here is one question. Um, I think this is in the chat. Um, for for you, Peter, what specifically are the differences that you see between the North South divide in the UN Code of Conduct debate and in the National Laws Treaty debate? From Debadetta Bose, I hope I've pronounced. Um, Shall I take that now or towards yes, the? Yes, I think I think we have. Okay. A... Yeah. Well, the the most important thing is that the code of conduct debate occurred from the 70s to the uh, end of the 80s, more or less, and that was a period when we had a much stronger north-south polarization, both politically and also in terms of the structure of the international economy. Remember what has changed since then. Um, the Eastern Bloc collapsed. China has become an economic superpower. This has created completely different uh, structural patterns of investment. Up until the 70s, we still had classic sort of post-colonial uh, investment relationships where the primary aim of FDI was to get raw materials out of southern former colonial states. And the NIEO, uh, the New International Economic Order, uh, that's why it stressed things like sovereignty over national and natural resources. But today we have a multipolar world where uh, formerly less developed countries like India or, or China, which of course still have huge pockets of poverty. Uh, but then uh, if you go to some of the most impoverished parts of England, you'll see real poverty. Uh, Globalisation has created a different network of, of interests now. Uh, and so the debates on business and human rights are not north-south debates. For example, um, it's well documented that we have sweatshop labour in Leicester in the dark factories in the in the in the clothing trade. Uh, the conditions that people there are working under are, are, are horrific, uh, and and it's not the case that uh, developed country status in the UK preserves people against such things. We've also had incidents of modern slavery in Britain. Uh, equally, some of the richest men and women in the world live in what we call formerly developing countries. So, you know, the world has changed and that's what I mean. We have a changed environment. And so you can't assume that, for example, China is going to always side with the least developed countries anymore. Uh, and also the end of the Cold War is important here because uh, much of the North-South debate was a proxy for US-Soviet rivalry. OK, I think that's enough from, from me for that. Great. Yes. And I see uh, there's a remark from Umberto, but Umberto, just in the interest of time at the moment, perhaps we can circle back to that when it comes to when it comes to your comments. Is that? Yeah. Um, but point noted. Um, OK, so thank you. And I think uh, we move next to Dr. Alex Ansong um, from Gimpa, who well may have uh, some in relation to the, the question asked also. Okay, thank you, Claire, and uh, for, for the opportunity. Um, I'll, I'll be looking at the, um, the framework, the, the draft framework uh, a, a treaty from the perspective of international trade law, the implications for uh, international trade law. By, by way of introduction, um, the debate over trade-related human rights issues, you know, has been going on in the World Trade Organization context, the most uh, multilateral framework for trade um, globally. It's been going on for some time now. And um, if you take the commencement of the, uh, the Doha round, for instance, in 2001, there was a hot debate on whether to include um, a regime on labor rights within the WTO framework. Now, as um, was stated in the first presentation, there's been uh, some developed country, developing country divide on this particular issue. You know, whether uh, um, trade, the trade regime is um, the best place to address issues like labor rights or uh, human rights, but evidently, since international trade deals with goods and services, in the production of goods and services, there are trade-related human rights issues, abuses that will occur. And so um, the, the viability of 
uh, an agreement in the WTO framework for uh, trade related human rights regime is highly unlikely because um, a lot of developing countries will kick against this uh, uh, particular prospect. And so um, an overarching business and human rights treaty um, outside the WTO system, it's a more viable uh, prospect. Now, um, from the framework, um, the draft treaty, um, you know, framework treaty, the Article 6 provides very strong recognition for sovereign equality of states. Now, this is important because if um, we have a, a business related human rights treaty or a business and human rights uh, treaty, it would mean that the uh, operationalization will have to be done at the domestic level in domestic law so that the policing can be effective at that level. So it is important that Article 6 of the, uh, of the draft text for a business and human rights treaty, you know, recognizes the importance of um, sovereign equality of states and the need for the, um, the domestic uh, uh, action to be taken to protect and also to respect human rights from the business um, uh, community. However, there could be some implications for WTO law. For instance, if you take Article, uh, Article 11 of the General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, the GATT 1994, it, uh, it prohibits uh, the use of quantitative restrictions in trade. So you cannot place a quantity, generally speaking, a country cannot place um, a quantitative restriction either through quotas or a total ban on uh, the importation of a product into its territory. There are some exceptions, but um, supposing there is a human rights, business and human rights treaty, and uh, a country in the WTO has signed up to this treaty and refuses entry of a product into its territory on the justification that the manufacturing process breached human rights. What are the implications of, uh, for WTO law per uh, Article 11 of the, uh, the GATT 1994, which prohibits WTO member countries from placing bans on the importation of products into their territories? Now, there are some, um, there are some derogations from this, uh, this blanket rule. It's not that all pervasive because uh, even though Article 11 um, it, it proposes or implements this ban on quantitative restrictions, Article 20 of the same GATT 1994 allows WTO member countries to derogate from their market access obligations under Article 6, uh, sorry, under Article 11. So for instance, if you take Article 20A, it allows WTO member countries to prevent importation of a product into uh, their territories if it is justified on the basis that it is necessary to protect public morals. So the issue here is, can we define um, human rights under public morals so that if, uh, uh, if um, a WTO member country, for instance, has defined human rights under its public morals and says that I cannot allow a product that was manufactured with child labor, for instance, to come into my territory because it breaches the public morals of, um, say, the UK or France. This could it be uh, these human rights rules? Could they be defined as public morals? There's an ongoing debate in the WTO, whether we can bring human rights under the rubric of um, public morals. It's not a settled matter. We don't have a case law uh, within the WTO context to support this, but it's an ongoing uh, uh, discussion. And it's interesting if this is tested, maybe how it will, it will pan out. Now, uh, and Article 20B as well, it gives WTO members the right to derogate from market access obligations 
on the justification of protection of human life or human health. So again, um, the, the argument or the debates within the trade circles is whether human rights can also be defined under human life of course, and, and human health. Evidently, public health issues, um, public health, human rights related to public health issues will come under um, Article 20B. All things that have to do with the lives of people, if um, there is the risk to hu uh, human life, you know, you could uh, define it under Article 20B. So there are proto-human rights provisions in the WTO and that say Article 20 of the GATT. But the issue of here is the consistency of an overarching international uh, um, human rights regime, which some WTO member countries may accede to under the principle of uh, you know, uh, uh, state sovereignty and state consent. They can accede to these human rights regimes. What if other WTO member, member countries have not acceded to the same human rights regime? That is where there's the possibility of the extraterritorial effects of say the domestic law of a country that has acceded to a human rights regime and another country in the WTO that has not acceded to that same treaty. You know, so there, there, there is the possible conflict uh, within both domestic regimes and, with, and at the uh, WTO level as well. Then perhaps just to um, conclude here, there, there is the need within the trade sector and the, the discussion, the debate on trade related human rights uh, issues um, to focus also on the demand side issues of human rights. So if you take cocoa, the cocoa industry for instance, there's so much emphasis on um, the human rights issues at the supply side. For instance, the use of child labor. And little attention is being paid to the demand side issues where developing countries, for instance, are exporting to the developed countries and the tariff regimes in place in developed countries uh, does, do not enable processing of the, uh, of the uh, raw materials into finished products because the more value you add to the raw material, like the cocoa, cocoa beans, for instance, the more value you add to the cocoa beans, the higher the tariff you pay. And so the, 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 these kinds of tariffs and pricing systems are closely related to the labor abuses in the, in the supply side because if the farmers are not making uh, a good living from their produce, then they may resort to you know, uh, some uh, um, lowered standards when it comes to the production process and they may rely on child labor because it may be cheaper than hiring you know, um, the, 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 the labor that would be con in conformity with uh, human rights regime. So it, I'll, I'll stop for now um, and I hope that in the question and answers uh, time, maybe some further issues may be teased out from some of the initial comments uh, yeah. that I've made. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Alex. And you know, of course, there is this which you have um, helped us, I think, um, understand this extensive interface between the WTO regime and standards and the you know um, intended domain of a business and human rights treaty. I wonder if you um, if, if you have any view um, on whether it, you know, the, the obstacles to the extent that some may see there as being obstacles in, in WTO law and obligations um, in relation to the adoption of a treaty or states uh, signing, ratifying a, such a treaty. Does it does it make it um, any easier or harder um, in that respect if the obligations in the Business and Human Rights Treaty are uh, defined more openly or more specifically? Does that, um, you know, would that influence at all the sort of ease or difficulty of reconciling somehow? That's one, one thing I think could be interesting. And the other is, you know, I guess the bigger question, whether you think 
the adoption of a business human rights treaty might help to address these uh, demand side problems that you you know that you concluded by um, underlining. Because I suppose that would be one of the hopes of such a treaty that it would begin to be able to influence the you know the nature of of demand and to uh, channel demand into uh, more rights compatible uh, directions. So um, with respect to whether it will be easier, if I got your, your comments and questions right, at the WTO level, I, I think that it, it, it will depend on um, the, uh, the specific human rights treaty. If all WTO members have acceded to it, it makes it easier. However, knowing the dichotomy between um, developing country positions, and I'm using developing countries crudely, you know, because um, there are various, you know, interests within the WTO. And so all developing countries may not have the same perspective, but uh, crudely put, con uh, considering uh, developing country positions on this particular, uh, on uh, trade related human rights issues and a regime or a treaty, it will be easier to pursue it outside the WTO than within the WTO, because one of the problems with the WTO itself is uh, decision making by consensus. And the fact that, uh, you know, the Doha round is effectively dead because it's been ongoing for more than 20 years and uh, they don't seem to find uh, any uh, consensus on the sticking points it will be easier to pursue it outside the WTO framework than within the WTO framework. However, pursuing it outside the WTO framework also raises the issue of how many WTO members are going to accede to this particular treaty. And if all WTO members have not acceded to this particular treaty, how do you rope it into issues of trading goods? You know, there is the other attendant problem of what is called social dumping, where countries with higher uh, um, levels of protection for say labor and other uh, business um, and human rights issues, the cost, their cost of production is, would be far higher than countries with lower standards. And so if some countries don't accede and they are, they are, they are you know, uh, uh, manufacturing, companies are able to manufacture products at a lower cost, it would mean that they become more competitive in international trade and uh, what is normally referred to as social dumping, where uh, diminished standards result in uh, more competitiveness in, in international trade. So these, these problems, exist. I don't know how it can be resolved, but uh, uh, these are some of the very st important sticking you know, points um, that uh, may either influence, most likely influence uh, some key developing countries from not acceding to a business and human rights treaty within the WTO context and even outside uh, the WTO. Good, thank you. Yeah, certainly need to be appraised of, of such challenges um, in the treaty debate. Now, uh, I should move on um, without more ado to uh, invite Eva Gettner to speak with us about um, perspective from the uh, point of view of private international law. Dr. Gettner. Thank you, Claire. So I've prepared some slides. I'm going to try to share these now. One second. Uh, while, the yeah, slides, you, oh, sorry, you, while the slides are coming up, Eva, just yeah. to say we are posting, which I didn't mention earlier, we are posting the um, impressive biographies of our panel in the chat as they are speaking rather than taking meeting time to read them out, but they're there for your reference for those in the audience. Okay, can everyone see the slides now? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. So, yeah, thank you, Claire. So, um, I'm delighted to be here. And I was invited to the seminar series because I wrote my PhD thesis on the Hague Judgments Project of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. And I looked into the reasons for why this project failed after almost 10 years of negotiations. And I think that we can learn something from the reasons for, from 
why this project actually failed. So the Hague Judgments project attempted to create unified grounds of direct jurisdiction, so concerning rules uh, for courts to exercise jurisdiction over foreign defendants in civil and commercial matters. And this project also attempted to create common rules for the enforcement of judgments in civil and commercial matters. So we have created a global instrument which would have secured recognition and enforcement of judgments in civil and commercial matters on a global level. And I think that attempting to do this, so at creating unified grounds of jurisdiction and creating common rules on the enforcement of judgments in the UN draft treaty will be too much um, and it will create an obstacle to the adoption of this treaty. So there are some problems when you attempt to unify grounds of direct jurisdiction. So the concepts in the different states for exercising direct jurisdiction are very different. And the differences are particularly wide between the US and European standards of jurisdiction. So in the US, the exercise of jurisdiction over foreign defendants has to meet the requirements of the US constitution. It has to meet the requirements of the due process clause, which reads that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty or property without due process of the law. And this clause means to protect defendants against the exercise of excessive power by government authorities. And the US Supreme Court has interpreted this clause to mean that um, if courts want to exercise jurisdiction validly over a defendant who is domiciled abroad, then this defendant has to have certain minimum contacts with the forum state. When we look at the UN draft treaty, um, we can actually see that some of the provisions they would not be constitutional from a US perspective. So particular Article 9, um, paragraph 4 and Article 9, paragraph 5. So both of these provisions, they would allow the exercise of jurisdiction over defendant when there are no connections between the defendant and the forum. So these provisions would be unconstitutional from a US perspective, and therefore would create an obstacle for the US to adopt this text. Then furthermore, another problem is actually that the treaty it proposes to create unified grounds of jurisdiction, but then what would happen if two courts would assume jurisdiction at the same time? So the draft treaty would actually need to have a rule on parallel proceedings for this matter, which it doesn't have at the moment. And it's also very difficult to achieve a solution on this because again, the differences between the common law and the civil law system, they're very different. During the old judgments project at the Hague conference, the member states, they reached a solution in the end, but uh, it was not clear whether this solution would have been acceptable at all. And also it was the result of 10 years of negotiations and all the states were very interested in the project in itself. So it's not clear whether such a compromise solution could be reached again in the context of the UN draft treaty. Then another problem with the UN draft text is that it prohibits the exercise of form and convenience. So this is a very important concept for common law countries. A core, it's a core principle in international civil litigation. So um, in my opinion, this would also create an obstacle to the adoption for some countries because this concept is such an important thing for common law jurisdictions. And then finally, another problem which I see for the UN draft text is that it requires states to recognize and enforce judgments rendered on the basis of a ground of jurisdiction of the UN draft text. And this would actually require that all the states that they trust into the quality of the legal systems um, of the other states. And this is probably too ambitious. There are some grounds for non-recognition in the UN draft text, but these are not enough to actually address these concerns of a lack of global mutual trust among the states which exist globally. Um, in the old judgments project, they tried to reach a solution on this um, by means of a bilateralization mechanism. So there, the states would have only entered into treaty relations with each other. But I don't think that this would be a viable solution for the UN draft text. So, and therefore, I think that it is attempting too much to include rules on direct jurisdiction and rules on the recognition and force of judgments in the UN draft text. And having these rules in the draft text will actually enhance the risk that the text will not be acceptable. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks.
six minutes. Thank you so much, Eva. Um, I wonder for, you know, listeners uh, who may uh, not be familiar with the Hague Conference and so on, and, and this project specifically that you um, that you did investigate in your PhD, would you able just to say a few words to contextualize, you know, the Hague Conference and what, what was the objective of this uh, initiative to conclude um, rules on jurisdiction and, you know, and what happened, sort of what happens next, given that the process seemed uh, not to reach its intended goal. So, right, so the Hague Conference on Parliamentary Law is an international organization in The Hague and they have as, uh, as its goal to um, progressively unify rules in Parliamentary International Law. And um, they have been successful in some areas like family law or civil cooperation, but in other areas, um, other areas have proven to be more challenging, like the enforcement of foreign judgments, for example. So this old judgments project would have been a very valuable instrument because it would have secured the recognition and enforcement of judgments in civil and commercial matters on a global level, actually. So there would have been, so the US was involved at the time, the European Union, Russia, China, and other states. But um, yeah, as we have seen, so it was a very difficult process and it was very difficult for states to reach a consensus in the end. And right now the project has been revived. Um, so in 2019, the conference has adopted um, a convention securing the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments, but this only this instrument only focuses on the recognition and enforcement. It does not attempt to unify of direct jurisdiction. So they've already maybe learned lessons from the past by reducing the scope of the endeavor. And currently they're working on unifying grounds of jurisdiction, but it's not clear in which direction this will go. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. And I mean, I know that other members of the panel certainly are, are experts also in the some of these fields and have published in relation to um, private international law and jurisdiction. Anybody want to add any reflections at this at this point, or indeed any questions for Eva from amongst our wider participants? Um, certainly, I think Eva, you know, the, the, of course, a large component of the content of the um, treaty text advanced by the IGWIG does uh, relate to these matters. Um, and I think it's unclear to what extent that text is, you know, either informed by an understanding of what transpired in the context you've described or, you know, to what extent it's aligned or can be aligned um, with, um, yeah, with the, the, both the lessons and the sort of substantive content of what has subsequently emerged, as you've said, in terms of the, um, the rules on recognition and enforcement of judgments, but yeah, topics of uh, of extensive interest to the business and human rights scholarly community. So thank you for giving us, um, you know, a viewpoint from sort of slightly outside that. Um, next, I think I would like to turn to Marcus Kwajewski, um, one of those, yes, who's uh, expertise and uh, scholarly work span, I think, trade, investment, and uh, probably some elements of private international law as well. So perhaps you can also um, contribute some reflections on maybe some of the other presentations you've heard. Marcus, thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm very happy to be with you. And um, uh, thanks for putting this panel together and this discussion. I think it's extremely timely and, and important. Can I maybe uh, sort of s separate my six minutes into some more general comments and also sort of maybe uh, answering to some points that Peter and, and Eva and, and Alex made already? And then in the second part, maybe come specifically to the topic that you uh, invited me to speak about or at least reflect on investment treaties and investment law. So I guess I would agree with um, what Peter said and also what I think Eva beautifully showed to us that there are some elements in the, the third draft and they already existed in the, 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 the second and I would say also the first draft where maybe the, the, the drafters try to do too much. They try to go too much into the details 
Um, and um, that's certainly something that one one would uh, would need to talk about. And I think it's also very important what Eva raised that when you talk about jurisdiction, but I think the same will also apply to applicable law to questions of you know uh, um, um, reversal of the burden of proof. You're really going into the private uh, uh, law, the procedural law of of states, and we do have significant differences. Maybe just one reflection on what Eva just said. I think that the difference between the Hague Conference project. And the legally binding instrument is, of course, that the Hague Conference project tried to sort of harmonize rules on, on jurisdiction on any sort of all types of claims. Whereas here, of course, it's if you wish only in the field of business and human rights and the, the provisions say victims of um, human rights abuses shall not be barred from jurisdiction because of the forum non-convenience. So I think there is a bit of a there is a bit of a, a um, uh, 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 yeah, it, it, it's it's more narrow. So um, Peter came out uh, quite uh, obviously as a supporter of the uh, the framework convention idea. And maybe I can I can uh, uh, sort of um, uh, out myself here as, as a, a more of a critical uh, perspective on the the, um, the the idea of a framework convention. I, I guess I mean of course we know as public international lawyers names don't matter so whether you call it a treaty or a convention or framework convention is really not much um, of, of much significance so i think what counts is what is in the in the treaty and so my 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 reflection would be based on the question well what's the purpose of an international treaty what's the purpose of an agreement among states and to me i think you can first say well it should establish or it could establish new obligations of states states you know i mean we talked about um, sovereignty and of course treaties try to limit sovereignty it could clarify existing obligations of states this is what many modern human rights treaties have done in the past if you think about the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities but arguably also the convention on the rights of child and others um, it could basically just repeat existing obligations that's also what we have in the, the human rights context when you you know, you know some regional instruments more or less repeat obligations that you have at the global level. But what it should not do, I think, is not have anything on obligations. So I think if a treaty needs to have obligations for states. And so I think that's, so for me, would be the test as to, does this actually tell states what they need to do, or is it more or less hortatory language? And so I think if, um, I guess, uh, either today or at another time, one discusses um, um, Claire's proposal, I, I really, um, I'm, I'm really um, thinking. Well, what the, the, the main obligation, if I see it correctly, is Article Three, Paragraph One, uh, of the the proposal, and it says the obligation of the state is to um, take steps to achieve the objectives. And the question really is, is this enough to say um, this is actually an, an, a real obligation? And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of move to the second part of my, my short intervention now and, and, and try to show how, I, how that also reflects on investment law. Now, what's the problem with international investment treaties or investment law in the, in the context of human rights? Of course, we know that these bilateral and, and regional investment treaties, um, they basically reduce the regulatory space, the regulatory autonomy of states to protect and promote human rights. I mean, I think that's that's very clear. We've seen very clear examples on that already. And of course, in particular, because these treaties are then implemented through what's called investor state dispute settlement. So I think we have a very clear situation in international law where we have a regime which does have a potentially at least significant negative effects on the, 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 the ability of states to um, protect and respect uh, uh, and promote human rights. And that has been part of the whole debate on the treaty on business and human rights from the very beginning. So I think a treaty on this topic should, ha should have an answer on this. And if I, if I now look into um, the, the sort of the second Claire draft, I mean, we have the third Igwit draft and the second Claire draft, so to speak. If I look into the second Claire draft, it says um, article three, paragraph two, letter D, Basically, the obligation of states shall have regard to the need to ensure effective respect for human rights in the context of trade, investment, and finance. I think that's, I would say, that's not enough. You know, that, that, that basically is to tell states, um, be aware that there's a problem. And then you have, you have um, in Article 5, Paragraph 2, you have then a clause which says, 
um, the treaty shall not affect uh, the right of state of parties to enter into other agreements, provided that such agreements are compatible with the obligations of this treaty. So this, of course, raises the question first, well, what about agreements that states have already entered? Because this is, the way I understand it, a clause that talks to new agreements. It talks about entering agreements. What about existing agreements? And the second, more important question, of course, how do you determine that an agreement is compatible with the obligations under this treaty? And so I think, um, for me at least, um, the draft here is not giving states enough um, obligations what they should do. I think there are... Um, possibilities, I mean, that have already been discussed. I mean, for example, in, 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 in your draft, Claire, you mentioned in Article 3, Paragraph 3, Letter A, that states should periodically revise their legislation. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why should they not also revise, um, uh, review, and uh, uh, maybe amend their investment and trade treaties. So there could be an obligation to do that. There could be an obligation to engage into human rights impact assessments. We have guiding principles on human rights impact assessments on in investment treaties. And I think, and this is the last point, and that brings the link to Alex's presentation as well. Um, I think it's also very important that states try to influence to the extent they can the actual um, um, arbitration practice under these investment treaties. Because some of you may know, we've just recently seen an arbitral tribunal in the Eco Oro case, um, in which even though the investment treaty had a clause similar to Article 20 of the GATT, which allowed for exceptions, um, the arbitrators, the majority of the arbitrators, two of the three arbitrators, didn't accept that as an excuse for the state when it came to the right not to, uh, not to compensate a particular regulatory measure. So I think that shows how important it is who sits on these panels, and I think that's also something that um, could go into a treaty as an obligations of states to, um, to, to adhere to when they engage in these um, arbitral uh, tribunals proceedings. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, um, Marcus. And, you know, as I said in last week's seminar, the purpose of this series is not to um, see the framework convention through rose-tinted glasses. Um, and I think it's very valuable to have the contribution uh, that you've made, um, raising specific points that, uh, that flag where a framework uh, could be strengthened, a framework approach could be strengthened. Um, of course, what you said about, um, you know, it doesn't matter what you call it, was also a point which came through very clearly in last week's discussion of um, the spectrum of um, framework-like instruments, which we already can observe um, in the broader field of public international law. Um, so it's not a binary choice, whether it's a framework convention or something else. There's a lot of um, gray uh, area between the sort of black and white um, and lots of room, I think, to incorporate uh, improvements to a framework text and certainly to um, think about those areas uh, in which a framework could um, give a platform to the conclusion of other instruments which might be defined in more specific terms that could also help to address the, the issues um, that you have mentioned in relation to um, investment agreements. Just with an eye on the time, I think I will, um, rather than spending further time discussing those specific points right now, um, move to the next speaker so that we don't get squeezed at the end. Um, and I think I was going to turn next to Nicola, um, yeah. who has a presentation. I think, are you able to share that with us now? Yes, thank you. Um, I hope you can see it now, just like four slides. Um, so very happy to be here to talk um, about, in particular, the relationship between international labor law and uh, business and human rights, or the business and human rights, um, business and human rights treaty. And um, well, in this field, we can see that uh, for me, the task is a bit easier if I have to compare the framework agreement or the business and human rights treaty, because both of them are rather vague on the question of, of, uh, of labor rights. And uh, the goal of this very short presentation would be really to see how labor, international labor law could really inform this business and human rights treaty and the other way around, how the business and human rights field as, as such really is complementary to international um, uh, labor law and we will see that there are 
um, many questions that remain to be answered for a treaty, a binding treaty or a more general agreement. So uh, if we remember, in fact, labor law questions have always been part of the business and human rights discussion. And uh, you have here some of the most prominent cases that have been discussed already in the, for a decade now, more than a decade of the Rana Plaza, a Kick Pakistan, a Fire Factor, or even more recent case in Lafarge, uh, where people have been employed in a subsidiary of a French company in a conflict area. So many, many of the cases that we discuss are in fact related in business and human rights are in fact related to, uh, to labor law um, and labor rights issues. Um, now, what's very in interesting is that this business and human rights discussion has added a really an, an important value to international labor law because international labor law in general has been really developed after the first world war 1919 with the international labor organization with an idea that states really individually have to adopt uh, international labor standards but there is really there has been and still has been lacking this transnational approach um, in a globalized economy obviously capital businesses can move from a country to another um, um, can you see hear me because I don't see you moving anymore okay sorry sorry for the inter uh, interruption yeah so um, the problem of international labor law is that it has been uh, de designed as requiring state individually to adopt international labor standards, omitting that um, in a globalized economy, you have business enterprises that can move capital from a country to another, uh, impacting competition between countries and has developed this idea that business enterprises, when they operate globally in their supply chain, have uh, should respect some labor rights. Uh, in their extraterritorial obligation or, or in a transnational setting. So really the, the, the movement of labor rights is really moving the debate in international labor law to a more transnational labor law, which is very interesting. And we see as well in international trade uh, law, but as well in international investment uh, law, hopefully we can come back on this question because I think there are very distinction to be made between labor provision in international trade agreement and, inter and labor provision in investment uh, agreement that should be really uh, well distinguished. Um, now let's come back on this draft treaty, um, the third draft treaty. There are really very vague notions of uh, regarding labor rights in that treaty. You see it in the preamble with a reference to the eight ILO fundamental uh, conventions as well as the ILO declaration of fundamental principles and rights at work. Well, basically that covers four main labor rights, fundamental labor rights, which are the freedom of association, so issue related to trade union rights, prohibition of forced labor, prohibition of child labor, and the elimination of discrimination and employment. We will see how uh, these are then tackled more precisely in, in the treaty later, because there is in fact no real um, uh, articles or provision in either class free from agreement, framework agreement, or in the business the draft treaty with relate that relates more specifically on how to tackle these issues more particularly. We only have this Article 6 that makes a reference to have consultations uh, with st stakeholders, including trade unions. But apart from this, there is no more mentions about, about labor rights. So that raises raise some, some questions. But before I, I go to that question, I just wanted to mention that already at the domestic level, some steps are, um, having, are taking place. Um, regardless of uh, whether there is an international agreement or not. And I think most of the legislation, what we can call them mandatory human rights due diligence, due diligence legislation, covered aspects of labor rights where we can see, you can see different obligations with regard to labor rights in transnational uh, settings, uh, either transparency obligations, been very well criticized for being very limited or more specific due diligence obligations and only this year in 2021 we have at least four or three uh, pieces of legislation that have been adopted and that tackle at least one element of labor rights. Uh, Germany, the German supply chain due diligence acts have covered many um, elements of labor rights including trade union rights, child labor, forced labor, um, 
and other, such as Switzerland, after six years of uh, discussion, political debate, has only been able to adopt a very limited due diligence obligation focusing on child labor and excluding all small and medium enterprises from the due diligence obligation. So you see, there is as well uh, the legal aspect of how what would look a better treaty, but then there is as well the, the political discussion be, uh, behind it and what can we achieve at the end of, um, of the day. So all this discussion at the um, very domestic level that, are, that can inform as well what can we expect from a state uh, if they want to ratify a treaty that has some provision on labor rights. Now, the final, the final slide is here. Um, just some shortcomings that we have in this entire discussion between labor rights and business and human rights. First, I think the scope of labor rights is not really well defined. For, the problem is not about business and human rights as such, it's really that there is a dichotomy between international labor law and human rights law in that regard. So international labor law really focuses more on these four fundamental or core labor standards uh, that I mentioned, provision of forced labor, child labor, freedom of association and uh, prohibition of discrimination in employment. Now, on the other hand, you have human rights in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, like economic human rights, if you want, such as the human rights to work. I don't know how many of you have heard about an obligation by businesses to respect the human rights to work, for example. Um, the right to just conditions of work, this is quite well established and in fact almost all cases uh, in uh, business and human rights have dealt with the right to just conditions of work that may be, for example, uh, the, the fire factory uh, accident in Pakistan in the supply chain. All these cases deal with their, finally with the human rights to just conditions of work. But I think there is really um, need to really establish which kind of human rights uh, we want to have as labor rights um, um, in, in, a, in a treaty. And to be clear that there should be no distinction between those rights, uh, that there be core labor standards or human rights uh, labor related to human rights in an international human treaty, there should be no distinction between them. So I think there is a first need of clarification about the scope of labor rights for a business and human rights treaty. The second shortcoming, and I will conclude in two minutes, is that if there is, if we consider that these labor rights are equal rights, uh, they should be equal liability, a legal liability. And I think this is, this has been clear now that we are discussing this kind of cases on how to ensure that corporation can be liable when there is a violation of the right to just conditions of work in, in a work accident, for example, in the supply chain, this can be quite clear. Um, the topic of child labor, the prohibition of forced labor is now maybe coming on more with, uh, for example, specific situation of Uyghur um, work in China. But what about other human rights? What about the legal liability for a violation of the human right to work, for example? Or what about the legal liability for violation of trade union rights? Um, there are many uh, countries around the world that have not ratified and big actors such as China, but as well the United States that have not ratified fundamental convention of the ILO regarding trade union rights or freedom of association. So sometimes it's easy to design legal liability regime for when you can identify the very specific damage uh, but for some other human rights, such as the right to work and trade union rights, we have to ask whether this legal liability regime is the best option to, to tackle that question and what kind of solution we could bring in this, in this regard. But I think we have to, yeah, if we want to stay coherent, uh, we have to remind that uh, there are some human rights related to work and we should not pick up only one and exclude the other, such as the, the, the right to work. And the final comment is just this idea, um, this is just more general comment about what we can expect from a business and human rights treaty. Uh, it's not really that this will change uh, a business model that we have. All the topics that we're discussing currently, either child labor or forced labor, are really focusing on production processes, but we're not really challenging uh, what is exactly the purpose of, of a firm in our economic model. Uh, 
And I just brought an article on this more critical approach of, of um, the purpose of the firm in, under economic liberalism, showing that we can as well require maybe companies not only to respect um, to respect labor rights or, or human rights, but maybe we can as well uh, focusing more on the question of whether a cor corporation could as well fulfill human rights and if, if we remain in the field of labor rights, fulfill the right to work by maybe hiring more, firing less, or having more strength conditions to fire, or fulfill the human rights to social security, for example, if we remain as well in this field of, of human rights. So what are really the position or the possibilities of firms to contribute positively to, um, to economic uh, human rights and labor rights in particular to fulfill them and not only to respect them. And this is probably not something that we are going to achieve through an international uh, treaty on that uh, question. So thank you for the attention. Thank you so much, Nicola. I think it really repays the um, investment um, to bring specific um, specific strands within human rights, specific rights into the sort of general reflection around, you know, the treaty text and to what extent it will work, how it will be applied, interpreted, given effect. Um, and I think things that seem quite straightforward and um, uh, not so problematic, you know, when you do inject these specific examples into the text, you know, are revealed to be um, uh, a lot more complex and difficult, which is not to say, you know, we shouldn't proceed with a treaty or or keep um, going with that effort. But I think, you know, it's incredibly enriching for the discussion to bring these um, specific lenses. Now, without more, um, I will move straight to Olga Martin Ortega um, from the University of Greenwich. Thank you, Olga. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, uh, it's fantastic to be here with esteemed colleagues and friends. Um, you've given me the task of uh, considering um, the uh, BHR Treaty or the IBL and your framework from the lenses of the international human rights treaty specifically. So I will leave uh, all the regional um, uh, normative instruments aside in my analysis. So when I was looking at how to approach this task that you've given me, I thought about, okay, let's think of what are the main elements that would define a human rights treaty and that are common to the human rights treaties that we have, international human rights treaties, and how do they um, uh, uh, manifest themselves into the IBL and into uh, your framework, to which I'll out myself as Peter did uh, straight from the beginning, a, a, a great supporter uh, of. Um, so I looked at uh, the purpose, of what the treaty state, the purpose, and what is this purpose? What is the scope and, and the definitions that they include? What are the objectives uh, uh, in terms, sorry, the obligations and, and the uh, nature of the obligations that they establish? What is the position or the presence of the access to remedy or whether they refer specifically to redress? What are the monitoring uh, provisions, cooperation provisions, and specifically whether they have provisions regarding application to third parties or the, in, uh, the how third parties actually get involved into the implementation or get involved um, into the uh, normative development of the, of the treaties. So, um, uh, doing a bit of a quick analysis of all the major or the main uh, human rights treaties at international level, we can see that not all the treaties establish um, clearly their purpose. Many of them just leave it for the for the um, a preamble, and even in the text they declare concern about the current situations, but not necessarily. And in this, the IBL and your framework have moved. And I think it's a progressive uh, uh, development of international human rights law if we uh, start uh, specifically stating the purpose. With regards to the scope and the definitions uh, of uh, what is specifically the um, treaties are looking at or are regulating, sorry, uh, they, only the sectoral ones actually contain definitions. What is torture? What do we mean by disabilities? What do we mean by migrant worker, etc.? 
um, with regards to the nature of the obligations that establish. And this is, um, I think, important, and this picks up with Marcus's uh, remark, which I, I thought was uh, uh, very important, very interesting. Um, uh, human rights treaties tend to establish both the state commitments, and in the early treaties, mostly the languages states undertake to, and then move more as the uh, uh, treaties evolve, move more specifically to directly states shall, so states are expressing that they're establishing that obligation to themselves, but most of them establishes a contain as well declaration of individual rights. So it's not just states shall protect this and this other right, the, the word individual states have, uh, individuals have the, uh, the right to um, um, this specific right also appears in many of the treaties. And this is something that we will I will um, then discuss with regards to your framework, for example. So um, we have then the uh, remedy, access to remedy. As we evolve, we have more access to remedy, but many uh, treaties don't specifically establish um, uh, a reference to remedy or to redress. For example, the CRC doesn't specifically uh, mention, not does CEDO. This, the, this um, uh, right to access an effective remedy that has been developed later in protocols, etc. And uh, with regards to monitoring, as we know, most of the uh, there is a monitoring um, uh, institutional architecture from more, most of the treaties, uh, either in the treaty or in a protocol. And most of them include now individual complaints. Um, with regards to cooperation, very few human rights treaties actually um, uh, include an obligation of cooperation. They uh, recommend, they um, uh, mention cooperation with regards to the institutional architecture um, that they establish, but there is no general uh, obligations to cooperation in human rights treaties per se. And finally, not explicitly, there's no explicit uh, mention of the uh, in the role of a stakeholder in many of the treaties. It's, it's very uh, rare. So how does this, um, when I'm looking at the, at the ILB, how does this uh, play out? So is the ILB a human rights treaty? First of all, <laughs> is, is that its nature? Because, it, it, you know, its, its stated purpose is to clarify the obligations to start with. Does it, uh, it, it does not have, uh, and it seems that the main um, purpose is to actually establish the right, articulate the right to remedy and articulate it through uh, a system of uh, legal liability. So uh, it, it reminds me sometimes more of the, um, of uh, uh, maybe a different approach, such as the Convention Against Organized Crime, which is focuses on cooperation and focuses on the implementation, state implementation of oblig criminalization obligations, etc. So um, then, with with regard, that's that's the reflection with regards to its purpose. With regards to uh, its uh, scope, uh, very good. It has all the all the right definitions there. With regards to the obligations and the nature of the obligations, it differs as well from most treaties, which first establish what states shall do. So. The state shall stay and take this obligation shall do so the first obligation is uh, with regards to victims um and when we're talking about access to remedy that's fantastic obviously it does focus specifically on access to remedy we don't have with regards to monitoring we don't have individual complaints but we will probably in the mind of the drafters is this a, a natural evolution and um, and uh, with regards to the uh, application or the presence of stakeholder within the text is definitely an evolution to what we've been having with human rights treaty. So in this, you know, regarding my conclusion of the IBL, I I have this um, this uh, I, I can't give it a label of a human rights treaty just yet I don't think, but uh, and as Nicolas said well you know the 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 weakness with regards to um, international uh, labour standards is important and then Claire very briefly with regards to I think your your um, uh, proposal is is very good and we should continue to discuss it um, especially I have a, a long list of positives but given that I'm, on my seventh minute, let me just focus on things that I think um, we can uh, we can you can maybe consider in the next draft. So this idea of the um, sorry, this idea of the lack of the presence of the individual in the text, 
states, child states must state have to um, do specific things. What are the rights of the individuals with regards to um, the the enjoyment and fulfillment of their rights? And uh, uh, the uh, you know the uh, interesting element of the monitoring body. I would encourage you to actually include it in the text if possible. Even though I know I say uh, Peter, I think you. Your point about it, it, it leaves the possibility of a future implement in institutional design, but um, definitely the role of stakeholders is very important. I think it, developing this is a real crucial element of the new international law that we all need to uh, learn how to articulate because we have to articulate it. Because if we're articulating a role for business, we need to articulate a role for legitimate representatives and human rights defenders, et cetera, that goes beyond just particip participatory, consultative, et cetera. And um, yeah, I have my, my long list that I'm happy to share in uh, once um, I don't take anybody else's time. Great, thank you so much, Olga, and I look forward to, to continuing the discussion with you. I will pass the word straight away uh, in light of time to Alberto Cantu Rivera. Um, I squeezed the last participant last week and I'm determined I will not do that again. So um, just to say we will um, we will continue for some minutes after 2.30 with questions for those who are uh, still available to remain after the 2.30 um, uh, cut off for questions from participants for you know, five to ten minutes, but Umberto, you have the floor um, till 2.30 at least. Thank you very much, Claire. I'm very happy to be here and to begin with, uh, number one, I have to congratulate you for this initiative. I think it is fantastic to have the opportunity to discuss which, uh, with friends and such brilliant colleagues from everywhere around the world. And second, I have to say that whatever I say right now, as you are probably aware, uh, is only on a personal uh, basis because I've been heavily involved in the negotiations of the LBI draft as a member of the Mexican delegation. Uh, first of all, my first reaction is that the position that we are now facing, especially with this counter proposal, if we want to call it that, is similar to what we witnessed in March 2005. Either we move too fast or do we move steadily? And that is indeed a very important question in my view. But let me try to bring some nuance to this from the perspective of how uh, particularly the inter-American human rights system may react or engage with any future uh, project. First of all, a BHR treaty may help to define the parameters that will normally be used by the inter-American human rights system, both the commission and the court, to interpret the American Convention on Human Rights, which in turn tends to have a direct effect on domestic judicial decisions in the region. Now, a key element that is normally present in the inter-American human rights system is the logic of the pro persona principle uh, as an overarching approach to state action, which implies basically one thing, and that is the duty of the state to always opt for any action that will be most protective of human rights, even in the context of non-state actors and human rights violations. Now, this is not just a logic that uh, exists within the system. It has actually translated to many constitutions in the region. So it is re really, in my view, a regional approach to human rights, at least on paper. Now, in terms of access to remedy, which seems to be usually the most important part of the role of the Inter-American Human Rights System, uh, the Inter-American uh, Court and the Inter-American Commission especially has already made a shy but important reference to ensure that the procedural elements to ensure access to remedy, including private international law provisions, are taken into account. What do I mean by this? Uh, in its 2019 Business and Human Rights Report on Inter-American Standards, uh, it actually uh, said, stated that states need to consider uh, private international law elements from a human rights angle, not just from a private law perspective. And that in itself brings a very interesting notion to what the actual LBI process is now trying to do. Now, some level of engagement on this issue has already been taken in some cases by the European Court. We can recall the Knight Lehman versus Switzerland case, which actually addressed one of the topics that are uh, currently covered in the uh, BHR treaty uh, negotiations in the LBI especially. But then again, it was uh, a specifically different context. But there are some experiences already there. And the question in my view in this regard is, how does a treaty whether the current project or a frame, framework convention can contribute in that regard to bridge 
those uh, two different parts of the river, let's say. On the one hand, international human rights law, on the other hand, private international law. And that is actually a discussion that is currently ongoing in private international law scholarship. Now, one thing that the uh, system does that in my view is very important is to foster dialogue between systems. We have the Inter-American Human Rights System as two things. Number one, as an importer of international standards. And we can see that very clearly in the UNGPs and other non-binding instruments that they usually refer to, but also as an exporter of interpretation under a pro personal lens. And one thing that is important from this is how, for example, the UNGPs have been considered as an applicable standard for states parties to American Convention, thereby expanding the scope of legal expectations regarding states. So we could easily foresee how a treaty on this topic uh, could uh, help in that regard, could foster this dialogue between systems. Now, one other thing that the Inter-American Human Rights System usually does, and very insistently on the, in that regard, is to focus on adopting legislative and regulatory measures. That is a duty under the Convention, that is a duty that exists, as uh, Olga already pointed out, briefly in uh, several human rights treaties at the universal level. So that in itself is very important. It's not that we are creating necessarily something new, it's we're replying and advancing, uh, or we need to advance this obligation that already exists for many states. Uh, and in that regard, one thing they've said recently is how states in the region, especially, and in the case of the fireworks factory of Santo Antonio Jesus and their families versus Brazil, the court said it very clearly. States need to adopt measures and regulate the way that companies work. There are some other pending cases in this regard, but we will see probably in the future how they start to expand the content of that regulation. So a treaty uh, and the Inter-American Human Rights System may feed each other uh, from that same logic. And finally, one thing that I would like to mention is a challenge. The challenge, uh, the most important one particularly, is to ensure the capacity to fully understand and interpret international legal standards that are not within the general discussion of human rights by regional human rights systems. We've seen that in many specific cases, how these very technical, very sophisticated aspects of uh, international legal standards, whether binding or not binding, tend to cause some level of confusion in many cases, both, uh, well, there's been some criticism to Naid Liman, for example, in the uh, European court. There's been uh, several criticisms in relation to what the American court, inter-American court have said, has said in several judgments, but that is in itself a reality. How do we push forward that uh, capacity to understand this logic? Now, I know I'm already in uh, within my time limit, but let me give you three brief conclusions. Number one, the need to continue building upon the UNGPs and the fact that any international instrument, whether an overarching framework, overarching treaty or a framework convention, needs to promote international legal evolution, including the elements to reinforce prevention and access to remedy. Number two, as Marcus said, many of the building, blo building blocks are already there, so there are two important questions. Why do we need a treaty then? But also a second question, why shouldn't we have a treaty? to promote especially normative coherence. And in four words, we're speaking about either progressive development or codification. We have that type of exercise right here. And finally, and that's, that's also very important, unless binding standards are adopted, companies will most likely continue ignoring human rights. Um, this is something that diplomats and businesses acknowledge everywhere, pretty much. And one of the panelists here today said earlier in an email that I read, as I was waking up to come uh, very early to this meeting, uh, that there is this practice of creative compliance. Now, it is important to advance some level of preventive obligations and have a general basis for the development of such an obligation under domestic law. And a treaty in that regard could be convenient to do that in a more coherent approach. Great, thank you. That was a very dense 10 minutes um, presentation. Um, many points I think raised there that, uh, and you know, not of course only by your comments on Berto, but by everyone's that really deserve um, much more in-depth consideration and dialogue, you know, between us, I think, um, and the wider uh, business human rights and, and, and international legal um, communities. Uh, we won't unfortunately have time to, to delve um, very much deeper today, and I would just like to conclude by opening to the floor of 
um, participants to see if there is anybody who would like to post a question either into the chat, this might be easiest, um, or in by raising your hand. Meanwhile, un or until, unless and until uh, such questions emerge from the audience, if there are any final questions that you have for each other um, amongst panelists or points that you would like to raise, now would be the moment. Ah, Olga, thank you. Yeah, I just uh, want to um, ask the panelists as well the, what they think about the um, framework of the um, uh, convention against or, uh, organi organized crime, because that that seems to be a uh, pretty framework in terms of then immediately is developed by by a series of protocol, which directly affect uh, the human rights because protocols against uh, human trafficking and and uh, 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 in particular, no. So, to what extent is this uh, a useful model? Thank you, Olga. And I see also Marcus has raised his hand. Yes, maybe if if I can, I just want to react immediately to what what Olga said and and asked. And it seems to me that when the existing examples of framework conventions, specifically those that are called framework conventions in international law that we have are conventions where there seems to be a consensus by states sort of what to do, either to you know, go into sort of implementation in domestic law, or as you just said, immediately go into a number of protocols in which they specify this further. So I think, I mean, what I'm still wondering is, do we have this kind of consensus or would many states sort of also see a framework convention as a sort of a, a leeway to say, well, we, we can't agree on anything, so we agree on, you know, just the framework convention, I mean, then it's going to be it, right? And and then I think that would be not worth the effort. I mean, but if, if one would have sufficient hope that the framework convention would immediately be followed by protocols on jurisdiction, protocols on the rights of victims or what have you, then I think that would be a, a, a different story. But I think that's very important. Yes. Um... Thank you for that point, Marcus. There's one question in the chat, um, which is, how would we know that the LBI has sufficient support to be adopted by at least some states? Is there a certain number? Are there certain necessary adopters, for instance, the EU, which is a question from Mary Elizabeth Bultemeyer. Um, well, would anyone, Peter, I see your hand is up. Perhaps you could uh, reflect on that point um, in addition. Yes, I was, I, I was going to, because obviously one of the main themes in my short presentation was about the, the fact that key players uh, are expressing doubts. Uh, I mean, the United States, the UK, um, Japan, um, these are three major home countries and home regions. The EU has changed. It's a bit more supportive these days than it was initially. But my concern with the EU is that once the mandatory EU proposal develops, the EU will lose interest in the LBI. And there is also the possibility that there will be a kind of forum shifting effect, that uh, European countries will concentrate on Brussels and the debates in Brussels. After all, for example, the German Confederation of Industries was very opposed to, to the German law having full liability rules. I think the German law as it stands now is a kind of negotiating template. And will German business allow uh, the EU level to go any further? And the answer is probably not. So there's a kind of uh, uh, an issue here of resource stretch, uh, which might exclude the EU. But one, one thing that could happen is that the proponent states adopt the treaty among themselves. But then what would that achieve? If we look at the third draft, a lot of the obligations are obligations that can't really be put into effect unless home countries of multinationals uh, take an active part in uh, changing their laws. So in a sense, we'd have a model which nobody applies. Um, now, that may have some rhetorical and 
and, and debate uh, discussional benefits. You know, we should never discard the idea of modelling as, as a name in as Braithwaite and Drachos show in their magisterial book on international business regulation. Uh, modelling is very important, but uh, surely the, the, the whole process is for a binding treaty that is binding on as many of the active participants in creating the conditions for human rights compliance as possible. And that effectively boils down to corporate accept, acceptance that they are subject to the new regime. And for that to, to happen, the home countries have to be on board. Uh, uh, so otherwise, we'll just have another uh, uh, instrument for the archaeology of business and human rights to study. Um, I, I, and that's why I sort of feel, well, the framework agreement may create greater consensus, but I fully agree with Marcus that if we just have a framework and then nothing happens afterwards, the result is pretty much the same as if we have a binding LBI supported by a small minority of states. Thanks. Thank you, um, Peter. And I think since there don't appear to be um, other questions in chat, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time, and we were supposed to end already at 2.30 CET, I will draw it to a close there just to uh, reiterate the invitation um, to you all and those of you who are listening to join us again next week for our third seminar, which will focus on supporting the operation of a framework uh, treaty in practice. Um, where we will be joined by um, Professor Basha Kali from the Hertie School in Berlin, Professor Erica Dort from the University of Utah, Dr. Anja Mir from the Center on Governance through Human Rights in Berlin, Dr. Thomas Pegram from UCL in London, and Dr. Michael Reiner from Humboldt University in Berlin and where we will be trying to draw on what we already know about uh, treaty regimes in other contexts, and particularly human rights regimes um, in other contexts, to inform the uh, discussion around the sort of institutional architecture and infrastructure that should be associated um, perhaps with a framework treaty or other business and human rights um, binding instrument. So thank you again um, wholeheartedly to, to all of those join panelists and participants and um, now we leave you for today. <laughs>